Hello everyone, welcome to Clinical Physio. It's a pleasure for me to have Marie with me. Right, um, we had a question uh, before today, please feel free to add your questions to the chat and Marie and I will do our best to answer them. Um, but I know that one question that came through beforehand was about rotator cuff repairs and Marie, your experience of when someone perhaps who's more elderly um, might have a fall and is diagnosed with a rotator cuff repair, uh, a diagnosed with a rotator cuff tear, when do the surgeons look to decide to operate or not to operate? Okay, so rotator cuff tears is a massive, massive topic in terms of we know from research that there's people wandering around with partial thickness tears that are not mm. bothering them, sometimes even full thickness tears that are not symptomatic at all. So it's thinking about the onset of the issue, I guess. So and there's lots of stuff going on with surgeries and whether we should operate in um, acutely or what, mm. thing, things like um, things like ACL reconstructions. Actually, do we need to do them? And I think the same is kind of being extrapolated to the shoulder. So where we work currently, the main thing is thinking about when did that pain start? When did their shoulder problem start? Mm. So looking at whether there's been trauma versus atraumatic we know as we get older our tissue quality changes and we are more likely to get some changes in tendon quality attritional over time and from research i think i'm happy to be corrected on this but i think that with the atraumatic tears we tend to see a less successful mm. result with surgery compared to the traumas but every centre is very different. So we've got a set of, kind of guidelines on who we'd expect to be referred through and when. So the key thing for us is having that trauma. So mm. you're looking at someone that's had maybe a fall onto an outstretched arm, um, a shoulder dislocation, some kind of event where they went, that is when my pain started. And that fits with um the pattern that you'd expect for rotator cuff tears so weakness and pain and your kind of positive rotator cuff signs so our current pathway i believe is six weeks of conservative management mm -hmm. i'll have to double check that mm -hmm. and if they're not progressing then referring through mm -hmm. for surgical opinion mm -hmm. that's slightly different for the atraumatic group so someone where they just say had a couple of years of grumbling shoulder pain that's gradually getting worse we probably look at a more extended conservative management mm. um period because we know that surgery isn't necessarily as successful for them mm. does that answer the question yeah absolutely i think one of the big thing that i in the past um that i always remember is is being um is thinking to myself that when someone has a partial tear Oh, that means that, you know, the patient's come in and said, oh, yeah, my scan said I had a tear of my supraspinatus. And that means, right, they're definitely having surgery where, of course, these days people can definitely improve with partial tears. And when you um, find that someone has an ultrasound scan that says that they've got a partial tear, they may well go back to doing lots without surgery, mightn't they? Yeah, absolutely. I think it really depends on the individual, depends how much it's affecting them, mm. depends whether they're a surgical candidate or not. Um, is another big factor as well and I think there's so much out there with rotator cuff tears in terms of research so you can there'll be numbers that quote if you've got a partial thickness tear the chance of it progressing to a full thickness tear mm. and stuff like that but you've got to look at the person in front of you and is surgery in their best interests is it going to give them the outcome mm. they want are they going to do well with it? Because mm. um, there's so many complications that come along with surgery. Mm. So that is an MDT decision, mm. surgeon, hopefully the therapist working in clinic alongside the patient and helping them to make an informed decision. Um, with rotator cuff repairs, the healing of the actual repairs, questionable. So whilst we know that physio is not going to make the tear heal, mm -hmm. There is research papers, I think the UCUF trial, so that the UCUF trial looked at asymptomatic, um, mm -hmm. atraumatic um, rotator cuff tears in certain populations. And I think they had about a 40% healing rate, not mm -hmm. fate retail rate, that's okay. what it was. Yeah, yeah. So does it do rotator cuff repairs mm -hmm. actually 
heal yeah content. or do a it's lot a of lovely them. questions so yeah I think more questions than answers. Yeah, I'm sure. And as you said, a lot of them will go on to re-tear because the quality of the new tendon that's been repaired isn't as strong as we would often like it to be, especially if there's been a trauma that's torn it and therefore put it in a vulnerable position in the first place. Cool. All right. Let's have a look. I think I saw a couple of other questions. Uh, definitely one about... Oh, let's go down there. Let's see what we've got. Okay, okay, okay. Clear the difference between frozen shoulder and rotator cuff. I think we can do that. Oh, that's a nice one. That's a nice one. What would you like to say first on frozen shoulders? Frozen shoulders. So really simply, you're looking for a reduction in active and passive range of movement with frozen shoulder. So frozen mm. shoulder is massively overdiagnosed, mm. just to throw that in the mix as well. And there's lots of other causes to shoulder stiffness that it's really important that you consider. But the key barn door frozen shoulder is active and passive range of movement mm. reductions mm. in that capsular pattern. Mm -hmm. So external rotation, abduction and internal rotation. Sounds good. Uh, sometimes people remember LAM as the uh, capsular pattern for the shoulder. L-A-M lateral abduction medial rotation as Marie was saying uh, in different phrases and I think one of the key things that we find with um, frozen shoulders these days is that more of the time it's it depends what stage of the frozen shoulder they're in but if in there they're in that what we now refer to as the pain dominant phase then there's a lot of pain um, with an increased mm -hmm. amount of stiffness and a lot of the time it's during that phase where um, ESPs or consultants or GPs might be referring the patient for an x-ray because there are um, things that can mimic a frozen shoulder such as posterior dislocation, such as horrible things like cancer. But as Marie said, the key definitive factor is stiffness, isn't it? And especially in terms of that external rotation, it's really stiff, isn't it? We look Sometimes we look at about 10 degrees and less for um, There's lots of different rotation. definitions in terms of what you're looking for. I think there's places that um, say a certain number of degrees less compared to the other side. I can't remember mm -hmm. what paper that was from. Um, but there's other reasons that you might get a stiff shoulder. You might get mm -hmm. muscle guarding. Mm -hmm. So there's been lots of work on lots of research into frozen shoulder and exploring things because lots of, a lot has changed recently because I'm glad you mentioned the kind of about pain predominant mm. and stiffness predominant because we used to talk a bit about freezing, frozen thawing. We used to call it adhesive capsulitis whereas actually now we don't think mm. there's adhesions so there's loads changing with frozen shoulder yeah, and absolutely. it's quite difficult to keep up to date with it but you're right the key things are looking for other causes of shoulder stiffness so again I know lots of places where if you think someone's got a frozen shoulder they should have a x-ray of their shoulder to exclude mm. something like a locked posterior dislocation or significant OA, because mm, that will sure. also present with reduction in active and passive range of movement. Um, so you've always got to bear in mind your nasty stuff. Mm. There was some talk about whether we should be doing x-rays or not, and I think there was a couple of trusts that did a pilot to look at who they would have x-rayed mm. if they if it wasn't kind of a blanket thing. So it's going to vary trust by trust, mm. exactly the same as your you pathways with rotator cuff tears mm. everywhere is different so if you're on placement or if you're working in an msk department it's really important that you make yourself aware mm. of those kind of processes and guidelines so that you know what you need to do should that kind of situation arise cool i think some of the other things in terms of um if we compare that to the other side because of course the question is difference between frozen shoulder and rotator cuff when you've got um something to do with rotated cuff issues um, it might well be stiff, but whereas a frozen shoulder will be stiff for a very long period of time, 12 months plus, sometimes you can get stiffness with a rotator cuff issue that improves over a couple of weeks with some strengthening, with some range of movement, etc. And so I think a lot of the time what we sometimes find in clinic is that when someone has, let's say, a lot of pain with resisted testing, that might be more indicative of a rotator cuff issue because of the fact that you're testing the tendons which are in trouble. Um, and I think you might well find that sometimes that stiffness eases and improves over a couple of sessions, um, whereas frozen shoulder generally does not. Other key thing with frozen shoulder, by the way, is the age, because it's very specifically in the region of an average age of 50 years old. 
they sometimes uh, describe a range of between 45 and 55, which is when people um, most commonly get a frozen shoulder. Right. Any key, you'll never get an 80 year old yeah. with a frozen shoulder. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, right. Sorry. Uh, I need to just press that to exit that. There we go. Just right. another thing on cardiac sure. tendinopathy. With with every body part, your history is really, really important. So if someone is presenting with pain over the outside of their arm that mm. came on after they spent the weekend doing DIY or yeah. painting the entire house, that's going to give you a picture that they've overloaded their shoulder. Mm. So you're looking for that kind of pattern with the history. Sure. And the same with all other body parts particularly the shoulder if you ask the right questions and you give your patient the right tools to express what's happened to them they'll tell you in your subjective mm. history exactly what is wrong with their shoulder and the history is so key that i can't stress that enough i sure. would much rather and i do spend 20 minutes on a subjective assessment five minutes doing objective because that gives me a much better insight into what's happened and what the patient aims are mm. than if I did five minutes objective bish bash bosh and then just cracked on with a mm. million objective tests. Sure absolutely especially when shoulder tests generally are going more and more out of fashion. Um, Sarah's kind of uh, added on or, or continue that question how do you rule uh, how do you rule out rotator cuff involvement in pain when suspecting a frozen shoulder as EMGs show you can't truly get passive movement or on assessment? And I suppose that that's the thing in terms of the true frozen shoulder. It's stiff, stiff, stiff. It's active and passive. You're looking for that reduction in significant reduction in external rotation. So if someone's got flexion to, let's say, here, but they've got external rotation all the way out there, there's less of a likelihood that it's um, going to be a frozen shoulder. Um, and I think we generally find that when people have a true frozen shoulder, it's really, really stiff in that external rotation. I think uh, the other thing there is to have a look to see what you can do to change the stiffness. Yeah. So if you can change the stiffness in any way, it's really unlikely that it's frozen shoulder. So if you, I know Joe Gibson's a big advocate mm. for this, and I think Karen um, Guinness as well, offload the arm, so taking some weight off the arm, change the patient's position that you're looking at your passive range in, mm. just to take pressure off the shoulder and unload it, do you get a better range of movement? If you do, it's likely that the stiffness is not a frozen shoulder mm. stiffness, because if you've seen frozen shoulder, like I was looking, I was um one of the surgeries I got to watch last week so I was a capsular release. When you see the tissue that there is in there, mm. that is not going to change with mobs and offloading. It's, it's proper stiff, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. And I think um, we, we we covered this on, on a webinar, which I think was upper limb case studies, but I can't remember. This idea, very much like you were just saying, Marie, that a lot of the time now, um, when there is a stiffness within the shoulder, Sometimes we find that we can change it within a session, as Marie was saying. So you do some tests, you do some exercises, you do a little bit of strength, you do five minutes of strengthening with that session and their movement improves. That's not going to be a frozen shoulder because your frozen shoulder is a long term stiffness which is not going to change quickly and yeah. even under anesthetic when they wiggle oh, yeah. them around it does not budge whereas if you stick someone under anesthetic that you can influence their stiffness mm. by mobs by contract relax mm. yeah and it moves no problem um good question from zach when should you refer for a consultant opinion on frozen shoulder uh when do you start physio post mua or capsular release for frozen shoulder is there a protocol um do you want me to start do you want to go for the first bit? Yeah, sure. Do so, sure. When should you refer for a consultant opinion on frozen shoulder? I suppose, and Marie will jump in and tell me if I'm wrong, um, that when, first of all, consider the effect on the patient. Um, it's very normal that we know that this condition goes on for a long period of time. So it, even, unfortunately, if it's been four months and the patient is still feeling that stiffness, we kind of know that that's going to be the case anyway. So therefore, we look a little bit more on their quality of life and how much it's affecting them. Are they in a position where they can tolerate the stiffness that they have? Is it improving? Does that give them a chance to keep going with some gentle exercises and trying to keep pushing their shoulder a little bit more each day? Or if they're really, really struggling and things have been going on for a long time and it's not been budging um, and pain is still a predominant factor, then those may be some more signs that they could be referred to a consultant. Bearing in mind as well that 
Unfortunately, they're not going to be a quick consultant referral. It's not in the NHS, certainly in the UK. It's not going to be that you refer them on a Monday and they're going to see the surgeon the next following Monday. It could be a two to three month gap whilst they're waiting to see the consultant. Um, so basically more time where it might be that their symptoms could potentially improve. Anything to add on that? I think just making sure that you are really confident it is a frozen shoulder. If you've got any doubt that there is something else going on, they should be referred for further investigation because you've got to put the patient first and make sure they're safe because there are nasty things that present around the shoulders. You can get tumours, you can get some really horrible stuff there that can be massively life-changing if Mm. it's missed. So it's being 100% confident that you have done all you need to do to make sure it is a frozen shoulder. But otherwise, Mm. I totally agree with you. Pathway is going to vary location to location. But I think the key thing is, are they miserable? Can they put up with it? You don't necessarily have to jump for a capsular release. There are other options. You could look at whether a steroid injection would help them in that pain predominant phase. You could look at whether a hydro distension would work. So for people that don't know, hydro distension is a relatively new procedure. As in, when I say new, I mean in the last kind of five years or so mm-hmm. to kind of grace the NHS, which is essentially an outpatient procedure done in the radiology department where they do a high volume injection into the shoulder joint to kind of distend the capsule, the hydro distension bit, um, which I think the theory behind it is it pops the capsule. Mm. We, I'm not 100% up to date with what is actually going on structurally mm. and what the results are, whether it is effective or not. I think there's some doubt about whether it breaks yes. the capsule about at its weakest point rather than okay. at the toughest point, which is where your stiffness would be or the main restriction would be. But I'm not really sure. So there is that option for patients rather than hopping straight to capsular release. So definitely locally to us, we'd expect patients to have had an injection we'd have expected patients to have had a good amount of physio Mm. looking at range of movement stuff but also some eccentrics and some Mm. strengthening work Mm. because we know that the rotator cuff attaches onto the capsule some places so we know that strengthen to lengthen Mm. kind of principle um and before we think about capsular release obviously this is not a panacea it varies patient to patient. We would normally have patients that go for hydro distensions, sometimes multiple hydro distensions mm. before we'd consider a capsular release. Sure. Obviously, if there's some other stuff going on, so the operation that I watched last week was a rotator cuff repair and a capsular release. So this gentleman had gone on to develop um, a frozen, a secondary capsulitis essentially because yeah. of his trauma that mm. had caused his rotator cuff tear. So the combined procedure there was mm. slightly different pathway to what we'd expect with a normal true stiff mm. shoulder. And the second half of Zach's question is, uh, what should you do starting physio post MUA or post capsular release? So we start it the day after, the day after they're discharged, they're in outpatient physio. And our protocol is to get them moving in any which way mm. we can. Obviously, you need to be respectful of pain. They have had surgery, even though they've got the tiny little arthroscopic ports, they still have had tissue removed Mm -hmm. and had their shoulder assaulted, essentially, Mm -hmm. by a surgeon. So you do need to respect pain and make sure they're Mm -hmm. doing all the things they can to manage their pain, pain relief, ice, heat, comfortable Mm -hmm. positions. We like to get them out of the sling as soon as possible. Sometimes they're not even given a sling. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they're stuck up in a... um, Bradford sling up above the head to mm. try and get a bit more mm. range of movement if they're feeling particularly sadistic. Um, yeah. I don't think there's anything else. No, I think it's just get releases. it moving yeah. with capsular releases. Just go for it, enjoy, push through it. Um, I, I suppose it's important to kind of highlight what Marie was saying a second ago about the difference between um, a capsular stiffness and a, a muscle tightness. We talked about this a little bit on the um, on, on the webinar that I mentioned before, where, as Marie was saying, the rotator cuff attaches to the capsule surrounding the shoulder. And so as a result, um, a, a, a relatively new trend, I suppose, as Marie said, within the last five years or so, is about doing eccentric rotator cuff exercises whereby as marie said that's a really good phrase isn't it 
um, strengthen to lengthen. That's not mine. I'm going to have to oh, write right, Joe Gibson fine. for that. Uh, so. Strengthen to lengthen. <laughs> the idea being is that by working eccentrically, you're working the muscle in its stretched position or in its increasingly stretched position, which means that it can have an effect on trying to open up the capsule, especially as a lot of the time um, manual therapy is unfortunately losing faith with, with frozen shoulder stuff. Anything to add to that? I think the key thing with the eccentrics is that you're addressing muscle guarding predominantly. Cool. That if you've got that increased guard through a mm. certain muscle that's reducing, mm. so external rotation, you'd be looking more at kind of subscapular internal rotators mm -hmm. guarding, stopping you getting that range. If you work eccentric external rotation, mm -hmm. you're going to be getting a stretch through the internal rotators, which will improve range. I cool. don't know how much it affects the capsule. We know mm. that the cuff does have a bit of attachments onto the capsule, but the exact signs I'm really not sure on. That's fine. Right. right, let's see what else we've got. Differential diagnosis with fro with shoulder pain broken down into myogenic, arthrogenic, neurogenic, vascular. Alice, Ooh. how long have you got? Um, <laughs> that's a whole webinar in that's itself. A, that's, a, that's a whole <laughs> webinar in itself. To be honest, we are planning on running a shoulder differential diagnosis um, webinar at some point i suppose the key uh, one of one thing really to highlight is that you know you may well be aware of this shoulder special tests um are going out of fashion um there's less and less evidence behind them unfortunately um a, i think one of the key things that is really growing within shoulder assessment is getting a really good subjective assessment as marie was saying earlier um uh, think about if you're thinking about arthrogenic think of age if you're thinking myogenic think of function think of what they do on a day-to-day -day basis think of the uh, subject of history in terms of what's brought it on has it got a work component to it neurogenic check the neck I know that's really quick fire um, Alice but it's probably a question that is not a, a two-minute question it's probably a structured um, webinar that one Beth Beth shoulder dislocations to immobilize or get moving and how quickly oh that's a great question I think it really depends. So my personal opinion on this is that the shoulder is an inherently unstable joint. We talk about ball and socket, um, but actually the shoulder is pretty much a basketball on a golf tee. The glenoid is really shallow. The glenoid labrum adds a little bit more of a dip to it. But the reality is it's a massively unstable joint and a massive bulk of your stability in your shoulder comes from your muscles, particularly your rotator cuff. So for me, I think you're going. it's going to vary depending on the patient situation. I've certainly had patients where the consultants have said, keep them in a sling, do really gentle exercises with them. And there are situations where that is really a valid management plan mm -hmm. and you need to listen to the individual cases. And if you have those discussions with the consultants mm. um, as those arise, however, generally speaking, um, where we work, the the sling is for comfort and you get them cracking because we want to get that muscle strength mm. back so that you improve the stability around the shoulder. I'm not a big fan of doing kind of pendular exercises mm. and stuff. I'd much rather get people doing early weight bearing to improve their proprioception mm -hmm. and kind of a bit more dynamic range of movement stuff. So one of my lovely colleagues that I'm really lucky to work with, Steph loves kinetic chain stuff. Mm. So doing kind of table slides with a lunge, so you're getting the rest of the body to work to support the shoulder as well. Those are the kind of things that I'd go for, mm. but it is a really individual mm. um, circumstance. So I'd love to give a sweeping answer there, mm. but there are patients where their shoulder is really unstable or you've got mm. a massive cuff tear mm. and they haven't got the muscular, the myogenic structures to give that stability mm. there. So absolutely, I'm sitting on the fence. <laughs> <laughs> I think one of the other key things, and it's important that we say that that's just the protocol where we work. Other protocols around the country will vary. One thing that they often say where we work is sling for comfort, as Marie said, and then no combined abduction and external rotation so for no six weeks. Position. Oh, for position. Yeah. It's important to also mention that for six weeks, my answer was more about your traumas. If yeah, yeah. you've got a traumatic shoulder mm. instability, that's a kind of different different ball game. So with your traumatic shoulder instability, you're looking at an event that's mm. happened that's Caused their shoulder to dislocate they've had to come up to the hospital they've had to have gas and air to have it put back in or someone very brave pitch side mm. normally playing rugby has tried to relocate it or something like that so those are your trauma group mm. so that would be the group where we would normally get them going sling yeah. for comfort wean out of it as soon as possible unless there's any um mm. other restrictions that have been put in place by the consultant and the orthopedic team 
a traumatic shoulder instability slightly different I wouldn't want them in the sling. Mm. So with your atraumatic shoulder instabilities, you're not looking at the high level of trauma that's caused them to dislocate their shoulder. The common ones are things like pushing a door or reaching over to pull something out of the wall. So they've still got a mechanism. They can still tell you that I did this and my shoulder came out. Um, but it's not the high level trauma that you'd expect to dislodge your shoulder. Mm. So with that patient group, you're thinking more about neuromuscular control. Are they generally a bit lax? They might have some labral changes. They might have a really baggy capsule. But you, I would be, if I had a patient sat in front of me that had had mm. multiple atraumatic shoulder dislocations, I'd be wanting to get them out of that sling sure. really quickly. Get those muscles working. Um, Lauren Kali, a good friend of ours. What are your thoughts on manual therapy for frozen shoulder that don't want further intervention, such as injections or hydro distensions? I personally find sausage, we, sorry, that's uh, Lauren's nickname. Um, I tend to find that they don't really respond very well, um, but that's just a personal opinion. I think a lot of the time um, they tend to, uh, we talk a lot of the time about the actual force that you're generating with manual therapy isn't as much as we would want it to be to really test when you've got a fibrotic capsule. Um, if it works, go for it. But I, I think if you try it a couple of, if you try it once and you don't get much joy from it, I don't necessarily think that it means that if you do it again, you're going to get a, a significant difference. Anything to add? No, I think that's fair. I think like we were talking about earlier, the patients where you do get a big improvement in range of movement with manual therapy probably haven't got a frozen shoulder mm -hmm. in terms of in the short period. So if you they come into the session and they can externally rotate to zero, you do some manual therapy and they can suddenly externally rotate to 20, they haven't got a frozen shoulder. Sure. Um, it's a really difficult one. I think lots of expectation setting with them, keeping them strong, mm -hmm. giving them lots of education. I probably would do some eccentrics just to see if I could get it to budge at all, mm -hmm. but I wouldn't expect a massive improvement. Sure. And like you said, with manual therapy, what are we actually doing on mm -hmm. a physiological level? Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, Leah, good question. At what point do you stop rehabilitating a stiff shoulder after a trauma and accept that there will be a residual range deficit? Um, I like your question in terms of forward thinking, in terms of uh, when do you stop rehabilitating it? But I suppose that the, the thought process might be when do you stop rehabilitating it and decide that this person might need some investigations to see if there's a true reason why it's staying stiff? Because generally speaking, unless there's a really clear history that it's a frozen shoulder, i.e. age of average 50, gradual onset, unless there's a, a secondary frozen shoulder following a, following a trauma, um, sig significant reduction in external rotation and they fit that capsule history. pattern in the past medical history where diabetes can be an increased risk factor where thyroid issues can be an increased risk factor so unless you've got a very clear thought process of this is a frozen shoulder it's definitely a frozen shoulder they've had an x-ray as we were saying earlier to rule out other nasty stuff then it's going to take a while but otherwise I think there's every indication that if you've been trying some physio and you genuinely think I've reached the stage where I don't think I can do any more, then the next thought process might be, should we be investigating this further to see, is there a labral tear? Is there a rotator cuff tear that is stopping this movement from progressing? Anything is else? there significant post-traumatic OA or a missed mm. fracture? Sure. Or avascular necrosis is another cause of shoulder stiffness. So mm. I think definitely it's another one where the individual case it depends on your trauma it depends what investigations but if someone was getting stiff mm. and i didn't really know why they probably would need it. referring on yeah. don't let it don't i.e don't just accept that there's going to be a, a, a reduction getting investigated you can continue to treat at yeah, the yeah, same sure. time so refer on but continue and then you can put that on your referral to the consultant that we're going to continue in the meantime because like carl had said three, six months, it might be before they see a consultant mm. or go for further investigation. Yeah. Good point. What advice or education would you give patients with a frozen shoulder exploring the option of injections? I think the thing about injections is that you can now get these relatively quickly. A lot of the time GPs can, can administer an injection quickly. The difference being is that when you have... Um, when an injection has been done and therefore you're looking further down the line at a hydro distension, sometimes referred to as a hydrodilatation or, or something else, um, 
the the advice and education to give to patients is to keep going with exercises to try and see if you can keep moving it try taking your painkillers and try and see if you can get your pain levels under control in order to allow them to try and keep moving because you don't want them to stop moving and then get really stiff um any other potent any other particular advice there no, that's fine. Uh, if frozen shoulder is in the phase of constant pain, is it possible that the pain goes away by itself? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and the idea being is that, where, as Marie was saying, we now refer to it as a pain dominant and stiffness dominant phase. So if you're getting towards the, if you're starting to come out of the pain dominant phase, then it could just be a natural uh, it could just be a natural process. James, good question. What strategies or exercises can you recommend for improving hand behind the back function? Um, I'll start with a, a piece of advice that I was given right at the start of my career, which is that hand behind the back is a really challenging movement generally, and it can be a really sore one. I was always advised in the early stages of my career, so we're talking about 10 years ago, um, to that there's a couple of gentle movements that you can get patients doing just to kind of warm up to it so for example um just trying to g gently rub the side of their hip and then moving around to the back um i remember uh, the shoulder specialist where i work saying about that when they're in the shower get them to put some soap or some shower gel on the back of their hand and then they're just trying to gently rub into the side of the back or into the hip or even it might just be the the iliac crest if they can't get round that far but i'm sure that we've got some other words of wisdom that we can give you in terms of that um there's hand there's the hand behind the back with a towel i think if you're thinking about that they've got a restriction in internal rotation then maybe some eccentrics as marie was talking about a little bit earlier where you're trying to stretch the external rotators so that it allows them to internally rotate a bit further might be a good way of looking at it. And it may not be that you do that in a hand behind the back position, but by doing those exercises, it might facilitate more hand behind the back. So if we're talking about um, eccentric external rotation, we're talking, for example, about um, having something like a TheraBand where they're pulling into external rotation and then gradually trying to bring themselves back towards internal rotation so that they're stretching these. Or side lying. Yeah. Rotating out and then slowly lowering back down. So we're talking about, if we're, for example, lying on the left side to work the right shoulder so that you lift up into external rotation, then you try and so, bring yeah. back down into internal rotation. Hope that makes sense. Cool. Nice question, James. Thanks for that. I think the other, sorry, the bit that I was just going to add there is that hand behind back is a combined movement. So I think it's really important that you look at mm. the breakdown of where they're actually stiff mm -hmm. and where I probably, I'm, I wouldn't do a hand behind and that's my personal preference. There's mm -hmm. nothing wrong mm -hmm. with that. I wouldn't do towel stretches. I wouldn't get them to hold onto a table, shimmy across and squat, but that's just my personal practice. I would find the area that they're actually stiff in and work in that before them working into function. Cool. Here's, the, here's an interesting question. Which specific tests do you find the most useful for shoulder pain in clinical practice? And unfortunately, a lot of them are reducing. Um, full can, no. Empty can, no. Um, scarf test, I often do use for ACJ, but make sure that they're definitely pointing to pain on the ACJ rather than just general shoulder pain, because of course you're stretching a lot of structures there or, or, or posterior stuff. Um, uh, good old resisted tests are a really good thing to look at when it comes to your um, traumas and whether they've got a rotator cuff tear or not. Um, I know that with slap lesions, tests can be used in conjunction, uh, i.e. cluster testing. They talk about throwers tests, they talk about um, biceps loading tests, but the key thing that really ties a slap lesion together is the subjective history. Have they had a very specific trauma that they can attribute to when they started experiencing their shoulder pain? Any other particular tests that you love? I'll use a spattering, but to be honest, I totally agree with you. A really solid subjective and there is absolutely nothing wrong with doing a good objective, like a basic objective of mm -hmm. having a look, feel, move. So having a look, is there anything weird or wonderful? Have they got wasting? Have they got lumps and bumps mm -hmm. where they shouldn't have? Um, having a feel, so palpating roughly along structures to see mm -hmm. if you can elicit pain. Mm -hmm. And then watching them move and then doing some strength testing. I will have a look at some of the instability tests. Mm -hmm. like loading, oh, yeah. Loading, loading shift, shift, apprehension test. Yeah, apprehension, fair enough. Posterior apprehension. Yeah. Um, in terms of 
calf pain, ten, if I'm thinking tendinopathy type patients, I'll check that they haven't got a tear. Mm -hmm. um, but otherwise, I probably wouldn't use Hawkins Kennedy. No that kind of nears that kind of group mm. but that is personal practice we know that the tests aren't as accurate especially standalone mm -hmm. they're not as accurate as we would have liked them to be you sure. can use them in clusters but i think the key thing is make sure that you've got a good subjective history mm -hmm. don't let the the test special tests guide you yeah sure. very good michael shea hi mikey uh, can you explain the Stanmore Triangle? Oh, <laughs> Mike, I knew you were going to give me a tough one. So the Stanmore Triangle is designed by Royal National Orthopaedic Centre, which is a hospital in London. They deal with lots of shoulder instability. So you've got your gurus that work there, like Angie Jaggy. So you go and read up some of her stuff if you want to know a bit more about shoulder instability. She's got some cracking papers out there that I think I gave you one, Mike. Or I might, if I haven't, let me know and I'll email it to you. Um, so the triangle basically des uh, describes the three different main groups of shoulder instability. It's not a you're in one group and that's where you stay. It is a spectrum. You can have um, kind of contributions from each of the three corners. So your pole one is your traumatic shoulder instability. So your rugby player who's been tackled or tip tackled or landed funny on their shoulder when they scored a try and their shoulder has come out of joint through a trauma. Your pole two, so we can talk about the pole ones being torn out. Your mm. pole two are your born loose, worn loose, hypermobile, slightly flexible, your dancers, your gymnasts um, that have got a bit of extra laxity in their tissues. So they've got a, a, they've got baton scores of kind of more than six. They can get their hands flat on the floor, that kind of thing. And you're looking more at a lower level of trauma. So when I talked about a traumatic shoulder instability, mm -hmm. your pole two falls into a traumatic shoulder instability. So they still have a mechanism of injury, but the actual amount of force needed to get their shoulder out is relatively low. So we could potentially call them falls out if we're talking about worn out, um, torn out as number as pole one falls out as number two and pole three is your muscle patterning patient group so in terms of the overall shoulder instability 95 percent of shoulder instability is traumatic your pole one five percent falls into pole two and three mm -hmm. so torn out falls out muscle patterning is pulled out mm. so what happens is the patients develop over time abnormal muscle recruitment um that we the research would suggest is kind of more pecs, delts, mm -hmm. lats being overactive and causing the shoulder to come out of joint. So that can be habitually. So mm -hmm. they can do it in their sleep. They can do it without really thinking mm -hmm. about it. We've had a patient recently referred in who does it out of habit now. Mm -hmm. And he says that he just feels like he needs to do it um, to release pressure. And um, they will be dislocating in really unthreatening ranges. So they'll mm. be doing it in their sleep. They'll be doing it with their arm by their side. They'll have unusual movement patterns because of how the muscles are working differently. Your poles two and three, your predominant management strategy is rehab. Mm -hmm. So sometimes with pole three, your muscle patterning pulled out group. Um, you'll need to have a look at kind of the psychosocial side of things as well. There's a lot of contribution in terms of psychological factors there. Type 2, there is a role for surgery in some patients in terms of things like capsular shift. So if they have got a really baggy capsule mm. and you've worked on them with rehab, which would be your first line to improve their proprioception, to improve their cuff capacity, to get the rest of the kinetic chain working really well, there might be a role of things like a labral repair or a capsular shift. Once you've normalize the neuromuscular control mm. type three your muscle patterning surgery is going to be an absolute car crash mm. so they shouldn't they shouldn't even be thinking about it you can as i said you can move between the three so you can have someone mm. i'm thinking of a particular patient who had a trauma 
but then over time developed all these really unusual neuromuscular muscle patterns and they probably headed more towards a pole three mm. but they were also hypermobile and they mm. had a bait and score i think eight out of nine um, so he kind of had contributions from all areas and that makes that quite a challenging mm. patient to manage. But basically you're going to work on the same principles of getting their cuff nice and strong, getting the rest of their body to contribute because I might get the figures wrong, but mm -hmm. I think 40% of the stability and control at your shoulder comes from the rest of your body. Mm, so kinetic chain stuff mm. is really important. Getting the proprioception, so your body's awareness of where your shoulder is in space. Um, things like Derby shoulder protocol are mm -hmm. fantastic because you're working on weight bearing proprioception. You're looking at speed of muscle contraction as well. So if they go to do something quickly, that the muscles do kick in and keep the shoulder nice and stable. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of what you're looking at for the twos and threes. Cool. Hope that answers your question, Mike. <laughs> great question and a great answer. Um, Leah, do you ever use deltoid compensation exercises? And if so, what types of patients would you consider this for? The answer is definitely yes. Um, the Is it the Torbay? Um, Torbay is the other option versus your anterior, anterior deltoid. deltoid. Um, but yes, absolutely. Um, you're predominantly looking there at your uh, rotator cuff tears, whether they, they be a very low functioning partial tear, or if e e some patients who are diagnosed with a full thickness tear, you still can try and rehabilitate them. And it may well be that they might not be a very good surgical candidate, or they have a discussion with their surgeon and they say, actually, I'm 80 years old, I don't really want to think about surgery, I just want to get as good as I can. And in which case, you might spend a long, long time doing those kind of exercises um, to try and make sure that even though they have a rotator cuff tear, they can use their deltoids to still have a, a relatively good functioning shoulder. Anything to add? Other patient groups would be things like your reverse shoulder replacements. Mm -hmm. yeah. So we do reverse shoulder replacements for patients with massive rotator cuff tears that are generally irreparable and they occur alongside some arthritis. So mm -hmm. um, uh, cuff arthropathy is, tends to be the name. So the cuff bit is your cuff has torn the arthropathy. Arthritis changes a result of the cuff tear. So the mainstay of rehab following a reverse shoulder replacement is anterior deltoid. Yeah. Um, rehab other patient groups, say more experimental stuff like the ortho space balloons. You use the same principle of getting the deltoids to work to compensate for the fact that the rotator cuff isn't doing its job. I think the key thing that I'd add with um, anterior deltoids is, again, one of the brilliant shoulder specialists that we're lucky enough to work with. Um, one really key bit of advice that she gave us when she came to do a talk last year was making sure that you really focus on the eccentric component. It's not about the getting them up there, it's the getting them down. So you can get them to nice. do short lever, you can get them assisted, but it's about challenging the eccentric lower, whether you're doing that in supine, sitting, standing, with a band, with a weight, make sure it's the focus on the lower rather than the concentric bit. Sounds good. Fantastic. We've got about a maximum of probably around five minutes. So I'm ju we're just going to take a couple more questions. Um, Shelley asks, how effective is surgery for traumatic shoulder dislocations? What precautions would you take in rehab post-op? How effective is it? Certainly can be really good, whether it's an anterior stabilization, whether it's a posterior stabilization. Um, but I think a lot of the time, the key thing with the uh, rehab is to follow the protocol. Anything different to say? or I think it's make it, your indications for surgery are structural changes. Yeah. So if you've had a traumatic injury, um, we tend to operate more on the younger people. So um, shoulder traumatic shoulder dislocations are inversely proportional to age. The younger you are when you have your dislocation, the more likely you are to have re-dislocations because of structural changes. Mm. If you have a first time traumatic dislocation aged 40, you're probably not going to have mm. the risk of recurrent instability like you would do if you were 18. So the key thing is you're looking for structural change. If they've got tears in their labrum, mm -hmm and they've got bone loss around mm. the glenoid, those are your indications for surgery. Sporty, younger you are, you're more likely to go there. Mm. In terms of your post-op recovery, we have, everywhere will have their base protocol, your consultants will have their protocol that you want to, they want you to work off. But it's gonna, like you said, it's gonna depend on where, which direction the instability, the traumatic event was in, depending on what they repair. Yeah. And we've also got a big spectrum of what they do in terms of traumatic stabilization surgery. So you could just be talking about 
a little bit of cartilage mm. damage where they'll do a label repair where they suture things back together versus something where they do bone transfers to block the shoulder in or weird and wonderful things like romp lessage to fill in big gaps in muscles in the humeral head. Wow. So all the protocols are going to very change significantly. Mm. Where we are locally, they'll if they've just had the labrum sutured back into place you're looking at a sling for three weeks and their safe zone of up to 90 flexion and zero external rotation and just working on kind of early proprioceptive stuff so mm. low weight bearing below 90 degrees and just getting them moving within that safe zone and then progress on from there mm. but it really does vary you could end up with them in abduction sling mm. um and external rotation braces so they could have a really terrible um shoulder when they go to repair it and they could have those precautions for longer it, 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 the, the, in terms of the um post-operative rehab so the key repair. thing is getting good relationships with your surgeons so yeah. you know what their protocols are you can question them on stuff if you've got patients that are struggling but also read the op notes because mm. there's some real gems in there that tells that will tell you why your patient's not doing very well or why they've had a really pants recovery mm. so actually taking the time to read through the operation notes if you've got access to them is really important mm. because sometimes the operation notes might say things like any anything that you've seen in the past that might tell you that they've got a, a poor outcome ahead of them potentially um things like um when they went to suture that the sutures wouldn't take very well or that when they finished and had another look at the what they'd done it wasn't actually as slick as they wanted mm. um rotator cuff repairs is a really important one for looking at the op notes to see whether they've managed to repair the whole thing what the mm. bone stock was like did they manage to get the cuff back to its normal anatomical footprint did they have any issues with the suture screws that they're putting in the bones there's so much information mm. in terms of arthroplasties did they have massive osteophytes that mm. when they took off they had loads of bleeding you know there's loads of little nuggets in the op notes that will let you know whether things went smoothly or whether actually they were a bit suboptimal mm. and that helps you to reason the restrictions that they've put in place so it's really good for your learning as well as making sure that you give the patients the best rehab. Great advice. Here's a really good question from Dom and it might be the last one. We'll see what we've got. Um, really good question. How would you hypothesize something more sinister is occurring at and around the shoulder in your subjective? Now, we, we probably won't think of everything, but I'm sure we can come up with a couple of ideas and clues on signs that things might be I'm just going to go really simple. Go on then. Gut feeling. Mm -hmm. Don't try and get symptoms to fit a pattern if they're not fitting a pattern. If the history the person's giving you doesn't make sense to you, or they've got, they say things that make you think it's a non-mechanical pain. If your gut feeling is something's not right, mm. there's a lot of value in gut feeling, in mm. my opinion. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. Some things that... Uh, other things that I've seen in the past, we were saying earlier about frozen shoulders, because when someone has a frozen shoulder, they look like they've got a lot of stiffness, but they always have an x-ray to look out for things like pos locked posterior dislocation, as Marie was saying, very advanced osteoarthritic changes, osteosarcoma, avascular necrosis. So if someone's really stiff, get them an x-ray to double check. Um, Lung cancers um, and breast cancer is something to be aware of because, of course, the proximity of the lung to the shoulder and the proximity of the breast to the shoulder. So if someone has a history of those things and, and you're a bit uncertain about the onset of their shoulder symptoms and it's not progressing very well, a lot of the standard MSK things such as feeling unwell, weight loss, night lots and lots of night pain history of, of cancer smoking smoking of course Same near the lung lungs cancers, you're yeah. thinking about pancos tumors yeah and they're quite prevalent in smokers so mm. you're right that kind of that kind of pattern of mm. big smoking history with the night pain sometimes they do present as mechanical to start with but they don't improve like you'd expect them to so that's mm. the other thing to watch out for if you think this is a cuff tendinopathy. I'm going to expect it to improve in the kind of three month period like we would expect slightly longer if they've had it for a longer amount of time. Um, and then not improving in line with what you'd expect, given your initial diagnosis. That for me is a sign that they might warrant further investigation. Yeah. With your locked posterior dislocations, you're looking at an event. It might be that they've had a fit 
Mm. But the key thing with that is that they can't even get to neutral. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. their arms yeah. kind of stuck across their body. I'm yeah. quite lucky that I've never seen them, but sure. so this is all kind of from papers and other people's yeah. experience. Um, AVN, you've got all your risk factors. So there's mm. loads of mnemonics for AVN stuff. So things like aseptic and plastic rags. So if you don't know them, go and have a look at them so that you're familiar with your um, signs and risk factors for AVN because that can present um, with shoulder stiffness mm. and shoulder pain and is something that physio is not going to improve. It might be that they don't have surgery, but they do need to be reviewed by someone who makes that decision. That's sure. not our decision to make. Sure. Um, AVN stands, Natasha, AVN is avascular necrosis. Um, what a good way to finish. Big thanks to Marie. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for being kind to me with the questions. <laughs> <laughs> have a great evening, everyone. See you soon.